In this world, horrific monsters called kaiju can attack at any time, destroying dozens of city blocks in an instant. To fight these monsters, the military has formed these specialized task forces to handle situations like these. So after issuing an evacuation order and making sure all the surviving citizens have made it to safety, they are given the all clear to engage with the monster. The whole incident is being broadcast live, so everyone who is not in the danger zone is watching in anticipation to see how the task force takes down this monster. They send in Division 3, and these guys do not play around. As soon as the monster gets distracted for a second, they immediately open fire on its guts and draw its attention by jumping all over the place. But once the prep is completed, one member fires a rail gun at the monster, cutting a hole straight through its chest and causing it to explode from the inside out. Now that the worst of it is over, we get a look at the aftermath of the incident and the poor fellas whose job it is to clean kaiju guts out of the city streets. The 3rd Division receives a lot of cheers from the people whom they have saved with their quick response time, but none of that praise is ever going to be going towards Kafka or his team. And that's because their job only starts after the fighting is already over. No one cares about their work and they get no thanks for their efforts, but it's a necessary job so Kafka is happy to get it done. As he is hacking away at the kaiju meat, a drone comes over to him saying the research department wants a sample of the monster, so he puts some of it in a test tube and puts it in the drone. On the ground, a member of Kaka's team makes the mistake of hoisting up some of the guts of a monster, and despite Kaka warning him not to do it, it was already too late as he has acid sprayed on his body. It burns straight through his suit, but Kaka knows how to treat the wound since he has had something similar happen to him before, so he is sure his teammate will be fine. Kaka takes a moment to look at the workload they still got left to do, and he has no idea how they expect him to be able to completely remove this thing in less than a week. The team manager comes up to Kafka and tells him he is being transferred to clear another section of the monster, but it's the intestines, so Kafka wants nothing to do with it. It gets dragged away anyway. After a long day of dealing with monster shit, Kafka returns home but he can still smell the doo-doo up in his nose. He grabs a tissue to try to get rid of the smell, and he then notices a news report about the Keiju incident and the captain of the 3rd Division who took it down. Mina Ashiro not only did she manage to become the captain of her division in a relatively short time, but she is also credited with taking down hundreds of kaiju. It seems like Kafka has known Mira since childhood as they made a promise to get rid of all kaiju together, but with how things have turned out, Kafka is left wondering how he ended up on the sidelines like this. He tries not to think about it because he'll feel like a failure otherwise, but cleaning up kaiju shit is an important job as well, so he tries to convince himself that he is important as well. The next day, Kaka heads into work in a bad mood, and once he gets there, he is called over by one of his co-workers who wants to introduce him to the new part-time worker. His name is Ichikawa, and he says he is determined to join the defense force one day, but the others laugh at him and say Kafka had the same dream years ago, but he eventually gave up on all that and settled into his role of clearing out kaiju parts. He is saying all this to praise Kafka, but it's just delivering bonus damage to his already fragile sense of pride. Ichikawa asks him why he chose to give up on his dream, but Kafka doesn't really have an answer for him. He just realized that his abilities were limited, so he couldn't bring himself to continue trying when he didn't have confidence in himself. Even though he knows it's a sad way to look at things, he tries to laugh it off and says Ichikawa will understand when he gets older, but Ichikawa refuses to accept Kafka's depressing way of life. When they are getting assigned their work positions for the day, Ichikawa gets assigned to the intestines, so Kafka starts doing a victory dance as payback for making him feel like a failure this morning. But then Kafka also gets assigned to the intestines again, meaning another long and disgusting day of handling kaiju shit. By the time it's their lunch break, Ichikawa is completely wiped out by the stench he had to endure, and the same goes for Kafka as well. He looks over and notices that Ichikoa only brought one bento box for lunch today, while it's understandable that he wouldn't have much of an appetite after what he went through. He still needs to get proper nutrition so Kafka tosses him a vitamin packet otherwise, he won't be able to last through the rest of the day. Ichikoa initially wants to refuse it, but Kafka insists he take it, as well as these nose plugs which he says will make the intestine work at least somewhat bearable. Ichikawa is still being stubborn about listening to Kafka, so he stops asking and forcefully shoves them up his nose. Afterwards, they continue their kaiju cleaning till the end of the day. Once they can finally start packing up for the day, the others head out first while Kafka goes over the checklist of things they've done today, and he's glad the intestines are finally done so he won't be needing to do that horrible work anymore. As he is still looking over the things they've done, 
Ichikola approaches him from behind, so Kafka jokingly asks if he's coming back for revenge after he had nose plugs shoved up his nose. But on the contrary, Ichikawa is actually really grateful for what Kafka did to help him. It was thanks to his kindness that Ichikawa was able to make it through a whole day on the intestines, so he wants to show his appreciation. That's all he had to say, but as he is walking away, he turns back and tells Kafka that the age limit on recruiting for the Defense Force was raised to 33 due to the declining birth rates, so Kafka is within the eligibility criteria now. Ichikawa knows he has no right to question the life choices of others, but he could tell that when Kafka talked about giving up on his dream of joining the Defense Force, he looks sad. With that being said, Ichikawa doesn't care what Kafka decides to do, so he can choose to ignore what he just told him and continue his life as he normally would. Kafka thanks Ichikawa for looking out for him even though they only met today, but as Ichikawa turns around to respond, this fricker pops out of the ground and is about to chomp down on him. However, before we can lose Ichikawa to the monster, Kafka somehow manages to close the distance in half a second and push him out of the way. Ichikawa is surprised by the feat Kafka was able to just pull off, but they aren't out of the woods yet since the monster attacks again and Kafka is forced to kick him out of the way. He yells at Ichikawa to run away from here as fast as possible, so he can call the defense courts to come handle this, but Ichikawa doesn't want to leave him behind to handle a monster like this on his own. Kafka doesn't think he has what it takes to take the monster down by himself, but he also knows Ichikawa being here isn't going to help at all. He's still young and has his dream of joining the Defense Corps, so he can't let himself be killed here like this. Ichikawa doesn't like it, but he has no other choice but to leave Kafka behind, so he starts running off and Kafka draws the kaiju's attention in the other direction. It begins chasing him and Kafka is running for his life, and he's moving really well for someone who gave up on his dreams. He finds a doorway into a building and thinks he can use it to escape the kaiju, so he runs inside while the kaiju gets stuck at the door, allowing him to create some much-needed distance and jump through a window to get out of there. This leads him to have a flashback of his younger days right after his hometown got destroyed by a kaiju attack. Both his and Mina's homes and school were destroyed, but what had him the most upset at the time was that he lost his holographic Charizard Pokemon card in the chaos. Mina was upset that her favorite cat ended up dying. They both decided that they wanted to become Defense Force officers, so Kafka made a competition to see who could become the coolest officer between the two of them, and then they'll eliminate Kaiju together. Back to the present, Kafka lands on the ground and continues running after he gets up from the ground. He doesn't know how he let things get so off track after he made that promise with Mina, but he's got to survive this Kaiju first before he can think about that. He can't outrun it any longer, so he picks up a pipe and prepares to take a stand. But despite knowing that he needs to target its legs first, Kafka is frozen in fear and gets knocked out by the Kaju. He then has his leg crushed by the monster's hand, and with him now unable to move, it lowers its head so it can eat in whole. However, before Kafka is killed, Ichikawa shows back up and knocks the monster's jaw away. Kafka yells at him for putting himself in danger like this, but Ichikawa says he already notified the defense force, however, that doesn't mean he is just going to abandon a friend in trouble especially one that is badly injured. If he did something like that, then he wouldn't have the right to ever call himself a Defense Force officer. Kafka realizes that he has always failed to protect the things around him, even now, he is failing to protect his junior who's about to get squished. Just then, a tiger comes out of nowhere and tackles the kaiju's hand before several blasts are sent towards the monster, carving it up before a final blast blows out its back. This was the work of Mina and her squad, but she doesn't spare a second for Kafka as she hands his care over to some of her subordinates and heads off to go clear the area of any remaining monsters. Later, Kafka is in the hospital and thinking about how amazing Mina is and how she's gotten to a level where he can't reach her anymore, but he gets startled when Ichikawa, who is in the next bed, starts talking to him. He thanks him because if he hadn't saved him when the monster first arrived, or hadn't gotten Ichikawa to run and inform the defense force, then he would have certainly died in that battle. So as far as Ichikawa is concerned, Kafka is really cool. He really thinks he would make a great Defense Force officer, but that's still his own choice to make. Hearing this from Ichikawa that helps Kafka make up his mind to try to join the Defense Force once more, but then he notices this freaky thing just flying over his head, and before he can even yell, it has already forced his way down into his throat. He begins squirming in pain, but by the time Ichikawa is able to check on him, he has already turned into a kaiju monster. 
They are both dumbfounded to find that Kafka's appearance has changed, but Kafka tells Ichiko to calm down since he is still the same person on the inside. However, this old man doesn't seem to care and immediately calls the defense force to have Kafka eliminated. Elsewhere, Mina is having a flashback to the days when she and Kafka would spend time working on their kaiju slaying tactics. She found it really scary to have to fight something that would be several times her own size, but Kafka reassured her that he would always be by her side to help her through it. However, that was a freaking lie. She gets out of the bathtub and answers a call about the Keiju incident report at the hospital, and she says she will be there to handle the situation shortly. After getting ready, Mina addresses her team and informs them of the situation. A Kaiju has been spotted in the hospital, so it's their job to make sure it is taken down without causing harm to the people. Meanwhile, in the hospital, Kafka and Ichikawa are still freaking out. The old man, they try to show the old man that this is all just one big misunderstanding by making Kafka look as non-threatening as possible, but that's pretty hard to do when he's got a face that looks like that. The old man dies of a heart attack shortly after, and as Kafka goes to try and check up on him, he puts his hand on the wall and completely shatters it without meaning to. He can't believe this is happening to him. But the commotion has attracted the attention of several hospital patients, so since the defense force is probably already in their way, Ichikoa suggests that Kafka leaves. He agrees that him being here would only cause problems for the people, but as he goes to try and open the window, he forgot about his inhuman strength and caused more property damage again. Brushing that aside, Ichikawa says they should get going since the people here are starting to panic from Kafka's presence, so they both leap out of the hole in the wall and head into the city. The defense force receives word that the Keiju on the loose has fled the hospital, and is now heading into the city, so they prepare to intercept it. Meanwhile, Ichikawa is running through the city streets and wondering when exactly Kafka became a Kaiju, because he knows he wasn't one earlier today. He turns back to ask if Kafka is really still the same person inside, but looking at him now, even Kafka isn't sure what he is anymore. His body just started doing this weird stuff on its own, and he even ends up eating a random bird for no reason. Kafka eventually reverts to his less monstrous kaiju form, but it seems like there's another problem at hand. He now needs to pee. Ichikawa tells him to just hold it in since they don't have time for a potty break, but Kafka says the body probably isn't going to listen, and she'll end up just peeing on the road. But with that said, he's got no balls right now, so Ichikawa doesn't know how he intends to pee in the first place. Then this happens. Kafka collapses on the ground out of embarrassment and wishes to erase that moment from his memory, but Ichikawa reminds him that they still got to keep moving before the defense force gets here. Speaking of which, Kafka asks if he can still join the defense force like this, but that's going to be strictly impossible since he is the very thing that the defense force is trained to kill. He'd be obliterated on sight if they found him. It's a cruel fad for Kafka because even though he finally found the motivation to try again and join the defense force, he is now permanently locked out of that skill tree because of his body. Ichikoa doesn't have any way to console him, but he finds a good place for Kafka to hide for now. But before they leave the area, Kafka's attention gets drawn by something behind them and he can tell it's not good. Ichikawa asks if it's the defense force, but it's much, much worse than that. It's an actual kaiju. The defense force received the news of the second kaiju attack that's happening, so they split up so they can gain control of both situations. Back in town, Kafka is somehow able to tell if the new kaiju is the same kind that attacked both him and Ichikoa that evening, so Ichikoa thinks this is the perfect opportunity for them to escape since this will divide the defense force's numbers. Since Kafka's presence already made people evacuate the area, there's a good chance that no one will die from this attack, they should just leave it up to the defense force to handle. Kafka reluctantly agrees and turns to start leaving. Meanwhile, a little girl is currently being traumatized since her family did not evacuate and her mother had been pinned under a dresser in all the chaos. The girl's mother urges her to leave before she gets herself killed, but the little girl insists on trying to save her mother. Unfortunately, all this gets her is another dose of nightmare fuel as the kaiju is closed in on them and busts into the room to eat. It opens its mouth wide to take a bite out of the little girl, but at the last second, the girl is saved by an elbow strike from Kafka. The strike sends the kaiju flying several blocks away and Kafka is left amazed by how strong his new body is, but then he remembers that there are people in trouble so he turns to the girl and asks if she's okay. The girl is obviously frightened by him and Kafka's creepy smile isn't helping his case, but when Ichikawa arrives, the girl calms down as they finally free her mother. The mother is unconscious, but Ichikawa assures the girl that her mother is going to be fine once they get her to safety. 
The Keiji returns, so Kafka tells Ichikawa to get the girl and woman out of here as soon as possible while he stays behind because he wants to pick this kaiju as hard as he can. Ichikawa sees the lightning coming from Kafka, and immediately realizes that he wants no part in what's about to happen. So he hurriedly leaves while Kafka lines up for the most powerful uppercut he has ever given. The kaiju is hit with such force that it is sent flying and soon after it explodes from the inside out, covering everything around it in kaiju guts. Kafka is left stunned because he really just took out a giant kaiju in one punch. But no matter how cool he may look after his victory to normal people, he is still just a terrifying kaiju. He approaches the girl and tells her the defense force is going to be here soon to help her and she doesn't have to be scared anymore since he'll leave now. But as he is walking away, the girl overcomes her fear of him enough to call out and thank him for saving her and her mother. After hearing those magical words, Kafka is sent into a flashback of the time he spent with Mina trying to become a member of the defense force. And even with his current predicament, maybe there's still hope for his dream. Ichikawa calls out to Kafka and tells him that he has called for an ambulance so they should leave before anyone gets here. Kafka turns to him after giving it some thought and declares that he isn't going to give up on his dream of joining the defense force because he promised to stand by Mina's side. A while later, Mina arrives at the incident site, but the whole team is shocked to find that the Keiju has already been defeated. She approaches the little girl and asks to find out what happened here. But when the girl attempts to retell the story, she nearly starts crying from all the trauma. Mina assures the girl that she doesn't need to be scared because she as well as the entire defense force are going to wipe all the Kaiju off the face of the earth. The girl is happy to hear this at first, but then she thinks about it for a second and asks Mina to promise not to hurt the good Kaiju guy. She says the good Kaiju is the one who saved her mother and killed the other Kaiju, but Mina is still shocked by the words good and Kaiju being used in the same sentence. On the morning news, a portrait of Kafka's Kaiju form is created from eyewitness reports and it is dubbed Kaiju No. 8. It is the 8th Kaiju to ever receive a code name, since the Defense Force is yet to track it down. The cleanup crew wonders why the Defense Force hasn't found it yet, and as they talk amongst themselves, Ichikawa walks into the room and sheds a little light on what has transpired thus far. It has been three months since Kafka became the first Kaiju to successfully escape from the Defense Force, so officers are dumping a lot of the defense budget into tracking him down. The shift lead tells Ichikawa that something came in the mail for both him and Kafka, so since Kafka already went out early to begin working, he wants Ichikawa to take his to him. The other guys already know what the mail is about as Kafka used to apply to the defense force every single year and every year he'd be rejected so the team would have to cheer him up. Ichikawa takes a look at his results and is delighted to find out that he passed successfully, so he hands off to go give Kafka his results as well. As he was leaving, he stopped for a moment and took a look at Kafka's results himself just to be sure he wasn't going to hand a letter of disappointment to him. But after looking at it, he happily continued running. It looks like Kafka managed to pass the test this time around and all the guys are happy for him since they know how badly he wanted it. Ichikawa makes it to Kafka and tells him that he actually passed the first round of the exams this time, but as Kafka turns around from eating his lunch, Ichikawa sees that he is letting his keiju form show. Kafka had realized he was in kaiju form and could have really exposed himself if it was anyone other than Ichikawa, just now. So he tries to make himself go back to normal but accidentally leaves his mouth unchanged. Ichikawa gives him an earful about how dangerous it would be for him to get spotted since there are still new stories about him. Both of them had managed to avoid suspicion by claiming they had run away after the kaiju attacked, but while they fooled everyone back then, if Kafka keeps acting like this, he's going to get exposed sooner or later. Ichikawa hands his results over to him. But while Kafka is still happy, he isn't nearly as happy as Ichikawa thought he would be. This is mainly because Kafka only ever failed at the second stage of the test, so the hard part is yet to come for him. While they are on that topic, Ichikawa asks if Kafka really intends to take the exam with his body the way it is. The first exam was easy enough to take since it was just a written test, but the second one is going to have officers all over the place and they killed him on sight if they found out about his body. Even with the risk, Kafka is still determined to take the exam. Over the past three months, he has been trying to find a way to turn back into a human completely, but he hasn't had any luck yet. However, with the age limit, this is his last chance to actually apply, so he has to take a chance. Ichikawa understands his determination, but he makes it clear that if something happens to Kafka, then he's on his own because if they are taking this test together, it's going to be his rivals. 
Kafka reaches down to grab his water bottle, but when he has a little trouble opening the cap, he accidentally transforms into his kaiju form and breaks the bottle. Ichikawa takes back everything he just said and tells Kafka to drop out of the exam because he is going to get himself killed, but Kafka still really wants to do it. Ichikawa relents, but reiterates that he is on his own if anything happens during the exam. Everyone else is going to be here soon to start work, so he tells Kafka to get a grip on his transformation. Once Ichikawa leaves, Kafka reveals that he was really relieved that he passed since he wouldn't know what to do if Ichikawa passed and he didn't, but now he's got to get ready for the test. On the day of the test, Kafka and Ichikawa arrive in the parking lot of the Defense Force and Ichikawa is utterly amazed by the huge building he sees before him. He's been to a base before on a field trip, but this one is way bigger than anything he has ever seen. Kafka explains that they share this area with a special Defense Force garrison, so when something happens, both sides work together to handle it quickly. So in other words, if Kafka accidentally transforms here, he would be dead within seconds. Other examinees begin arriving as well, so Kafka doesn't see any point in letting himself get scared by it anymore. He tells Ichiko that they should probably head inside soon, but he is interrupted by a rude girl who calls him an old man. Kafka defends himself, saying that he is only 32, so he isn't that old. But even Ichiko thinks he is old, so he just has to accept it. His age aside, the girl bluntly tells him to move his car, even though there are many spots available elsewhere, just because she thinks she has a right to it, since 5 is her lucky number. Kafka obviously isn't going to budge for a dumb reason like that, so the girl takes matters into her own hands and prepares to abuse the fact that she is probably rich. She takes off her clothes, revealing that she is wearing the kind of battle suit the Defense Force people wear, but she isn't going to be using it for such a noble cause as fighting Kaju. Instead, she picks up Kafka's car with one hand and tosses it out of the spot, which she probably thinks makes her cool, but it just makes her a bitch. However, being a big shot apparently gives her the right to do stuff like this and get away with it as she introduces herself as Kakoru Shinomiya, and she says she kills Kaiju for fun. And coincidentally, she finds it weird that Kafka smells like a Kaiju. Ichikawa immediately tries to explain it away by saying they work in the Kaiju disposal. But while Kikoru was wondering why Kaiju disposal workers are here, Kafka has already gone and picked his truck back up. She is astonished seeing a 30-year-old man pick something as heavy as that without hurting his back, so she assumes he must have his own private suit as well. He doesn't confirm or deny anything, but he turns to her and says she had better remember him. While they were busy talking, Kikoru's butler had already gone ahead and taken the parking spot, so Kafka still ended up losing the battle. But now Kaikoru is excited by what this old man can do and can't wait to go up against him in the exam. She then turns to leave, along with her butler and security. Once they are gone, Kafka turns around and finds Ichikawa staring daggers at him as he warns him not to use his powers out in the open like that again. Kafka apologizes, but he only transformed the parts that would be hidden by his clothes he thought it would be fine. Some guards come over to ask if everything is alright now, but for some reason they were nowhere to be found when Kikoru was tossing Kafka's car. Ichikawa and Kafka both say there's nothing wrong, so the guards tell them to hurry up and get inside the building then. However, before they leave, Ichikawa warns Kafka that he will totally rat him out the next time he transforms like that again. Kafka agrees for his terms, so the two head inside, but as the exam finally begins, Kafka finds that he can't keep up at all. He knows he has been maintaining his daily training routine out of habit for years, and he does a lot of manual labor for his job, but that isn't making a difference here. Before the exam began, Kafka and Ichikawa went over the format of the exam, and it consists of a fitness test, followed by a random aptitude test. However, they didn't know what the aptitude test will be, so they needed to score really high in the fitness exam to make up for it. However, that doesn't look like it will be an option for Kafka as he is doing terribly. He was bad before. But back then, he was just barely below average, but now, with his 30-year-old back, he's at the bottom of the bell curve. He thinks to himself that he could probably get back in from if he uses a bit of his powers, but he decides against it for the sake of fairness. But once the results are in, he is really regretting being fair after all. And to make it worse, Kakora comes up to him to rub it in his face that she did better than him in the fitness exam. And that makes Kafka remember how confident he was heading into this, which in turn sends a wave of cringe down his spine. Kaikoru is satisfied with Kafka's reaction, so she struts away and even though Kafka is at the bottom of the leaderboard, Chikoa is proud of him for not using his powers to cheat. Kafka tells him that he believes he should give everyone a chance to let their hard work pay off, or at least that's what he thought at the time, but now he really wishes he cheated. 
Ichikawa tries to calm him down by saying the reason he got rank at the bottom isn't just because he sucks, as this year's candidates are truly exceptional. To name a few, there's Hamuchi Izuma who ranks second, and is the top graduating student from the Keiju Neutralization University. And Aoi Kagureji who turned down a million dollar sports contract just to come to the Defense First Force. Most of the applicants this year are from Keiju Neutralization Universities, so they've been training for this their whole lives. And the one everyone is expecting the most out of is Kakoru, who is a prodigy that graduated from California Neutralization University at the age of only 16. People have been trying to measure up to her this entire time, and hearing them talk about her achievements, Kakoru comes over once more to rub it in Kafka's face. He grabs her shoulders and admits that he didn't know how talented she was up till now, but then he gets closed by her bodyguards, who then proceed to beat the shit out of him for daring to touch her. Once Kakoru gets called them off, she tells Kafka she'll continue to outclass him in the second part of the exam as well, prompting Kafka to say he'll make sure he beats her. But even if he says that, he can tell he's going to be screwed in the next exam as well. Ichikawa tries to cheer him up by saying there's still hope for him since the second part of the exam has been centered around Keiju disposal for the past two years. That's incredibly convenient for him, but it's because they like to test the knowledge of candidates, as well as their ability to work together in groups. It's also to raise awareness of the hell disposal workers have to go through. That's part of the reason Ichikawa chose to take a job as a disposal worker, so he wants to work hard with Kafka and hopes it's the same thing this year as well. However, once they get to the actual aptitude test, they are greeted by Vice Captain Hoshino, who tells them that the test is going to involve killing live kaiju. Kafka and Ichikawa are both shocked because their whole game plan just went out the window, and once the kaiju spots all the candidates, it immediately charges their way and Kafka begins freaking out. But since this is still only an exam, there's no way the defense force would put them in danger of dying without any safety measures in place. Metal bars stop the kaiju from getting through and soldiers are posted to immediately kill them if anything goes wrong. All the candidates seem pretty calm about it, except for Kafka who fell over in fear of the kaiju, much to Kakoru's amusement. Kafka turns to Ichikawa and asks what happened to only having to dispose of kaiju bodies, but Ichikawa never guaranteed that that would be the test for this year. All he knew was that it was that way for the past two years, so it's not strange that they decided to shake things up. Hashino continues, saying that they don't have to worry since they won't be sent out without proper equipment for the task. They will all be provided with the special suits all Defense Force members wear. Ichikawa tries his suit on and it immediately begins shrinking to fit his body. And once measurement adjustments are complete, it activates the keiju muscle fibers in itself, making Ichikawa feel a lot stronger than normal. These suits are made from organic matter taken from kaiju and massively increase the combat power of the wearer, so there is no better way to fight against a kaiju. The operator Konomi begins measuring the unleashed combat power of those who are wearing their suits, and it starts with Ichikoa, who is currently at 8% power. Izuno Overuchi has a percentage of 18, and the other promising candidates have combat power in the ranges of 14 to 15. The percentage is a measure that indicates how much of the suit's power you are able to effectively use, but even after extensive training, most people can only use about 20%. Normally, they would be lucky to have even one candidate that was above 10%, so they got quite the impressive lineup of candidates this year. There's a bit of a disturbance when Kikor puts on her suit because her combat power is already at 46%, which is equivalent to the power of a platoon leader. Ichikawa is feeling a bit down since his combat power is only at 8 but Hoshino assures him that it's nothing to be ashamed of. 8% is really good for a first time using the suit, and honestly, as long as you don't get a zero, he'll be fine. He's never even seen someone get a zero before, but Kafka changes that immediately as he scores a perfect zero. Hoshino finds the whole thing absolutely hilarious, so he takes a liking to Kafka, even though he's probably going to fail the exam anyway. Kafka is really trying his hardest here, but he can't seem to get the suit to work for him and Kakoru is getting pissed off because she knows Kafka has some amount of skill since he lifted his car in the parking lot, and she doesn't understand why he keeps acting like he is completely inept. Hoshino enters the room and since everyone has gotten their suits on, the exam will now commence. The candidates head out into the training area and he explains over the comms that their targets are going to be one big kaiju and 32 smaller ones scattered throughout the testing area. These kaiju caused 15 fatalities already, but they were captured alive for the sake of being used as training aids. The candidates are tasked with killing them with anti-kaiju weapons and their actions will be tracked by the plethora of surveillance drones that will be flying in the sky. 
If at any point they look like they are going to die, then their suit's shields will be activated, and they will be disqualified. Hashino can't guarantee that all of them will be able to survive this next test, but if they are all willing to sign a death waiver, then they are free to begin. As the test commences, they all rush out into the field and Kaikoru is leading the pack with her impressive mobility. As she spots the first kaiju, she takes it down in one shot, and she is showing no signs of slowing down. Meanwhile, Kafka is showing no signs of moving at all since with his output at zero, all the equipment is way too heavy for him to manage. That aside, Ichikawa doesn't know what they are supposed to do since neither of them has much firepower with their suits, but then Hoshino mentions that Captain Mina is here in person to watch the exam, so Kafka gets a fire lit under him to perform well. He turns to Ichikawa and explains what he thinks the objective of this exam is. The control room went through all the trouble of getting drones to follow everyone which wouldn't make sense if all they cared about was the number of kaiju you managed to kill. That means they are testing the ability of the candidates to adapt to different situations, so since they lack the necessary firepower to be the damage dealers, they should focus on support instead. As they are running through the streets, Ichikoa notices some fighting happening to their right, so they head over there to provide support. They get to cover, and once Kafka gets a good look at the kaiju, he realizes that he has seen this kind of kaiju before. And since he knows how its body works, he knows just how to defeat it as well. He runs out from behind the rock and throws a stun grenade at the kaiju, explaining that this kind has terrible eyesight but really good hearing. So a stun grenade to the head will render it deaf and an easy target, so now that it is stunned, he calls over Izumo and tells him to aim for the kaiju's stomachs, since the skin there is much weaker than the rest of his body. Izumo is skeptical at first, but since the kaiju is about to get back up, he does as Kafka says and he is able to shoot a hole through the kaiju's stomach. He is impressed with how accurate Kafka's info was and thanks him for the assist, and immediately after both Kafka and Ichikoa continue running to find someone else to assist. They take apart more kaiju bodies than they can count, so they know everything there is to know about their strengths and weaknesses so Kafka can be useful without meaning to use his kaiju powers. However, while he was in the middle of planning out their next assist, Kafka gets blindsided by a kaiju that bursts through the rubble and smashes him into a wall. The control room sees that Kafka is badly injured from that hit he just took, and the kaiju is still approaching him. So Hoshino says they should start getting ready to deploy his shield. Kafka knows how bad this looks for him, and he is aware that the control room is probably going to engage his suit shields, but that would mean he gets disqualified, and he doesn't want to disgrace himself anymore, while Mina is watching him. He tries to get up, but it doesn't look like he is going to make it out of this in time. Hashino had figured that Kafka would be the first to have to drop out, which is a shame since he really likes how funny he is. But before the control room can deploy Kafka's shield, the keiju is suddenly defeated by Kikoro. She stands over Kafka and says he doesn't get to quit as long as she is still on the battlefield and Kafka was almost grateful to her, until she mocks him and says he should just stay here and keep being useless while she finishes off the rest of the kaiju. The other candidates don't want to let her steal all the glory, but the fact of the matter is that she is just better than everyone else, so there's no way they'll be able to keep up with her. Kafka wants to get back in the fight as well, but he realizes that his leg is completely broken, so he can't stand up at all. He gets connected by Hoshino and is informed that the suit has picked up that Kafka is badly injured and possibly bad internal organ damage, so Kafka has to make a choice whether to give up or not. He still has the will to continue, but then he remembers that he has the lowest amount of talent of any of the candidates, so he will never be able to stand by Mina's side because he isn't good enough for that. Hashino suggests that Kafka drop out of the exam for his own safety, but even if he knows he isn't cut out for this and people think he looks stupid for trying so hard, the choice to keep going is his own to make and he isn't going to give up anymore. Ichikawa comes over to check on Kafka, but he says he is okay and even manages to get back on his feet despite his leg being broken. If he's willing to go that far, then they see no reason to force him to quit now. But if things get ugly or his condition deteriorates in any way, then his shield will immediately be activated and he will be disqualified. Kafka is happy to continue under those conditions, but he can't deny that his condition is nowhere near decent enough to keep up with Ichikawa. So he tells him to go on ahead without him since he doesn't want to slow him down. But Ichikawa isn't going to just leave him behind because they came here together. And they are going to finish the exam together no matter what. Kafka is touched by Ichikawa's consideration, so the two agree to work together, and since Kafka's leg is still broken, Ichikawa is carrying him on his shoulders, much to Hoshino's amusement. Ichikawa feels embarrassed with how people are staring at him, 
But this is the only way they can keep going as a team, so Ichikola will act as the legs, while Kafka uses his years of keiju knowledge to help them attack, and all the while Hoshino is seriously considering giving them a passing score just because he thinks they are really funny. While Ichikawa and Kafka are trying to catch up, the other front runners for the exam are still killing Kaju and trying to not lose to Kikoru, but she is just too damn good. She proceeds to steal the kills of everyone she comes across, so they all slowly give up on even trying to help. Midway through, Kakoru switches to his staff and uses it to decapitate the last small kaiju in the area, so the only one left is the giant one and she's already all over it. She throws a grenade at it to cause a distraction, and while it is still confused, she jumps off the buildings and comes down on it from above before firing a shot straight through its mouth. With that, the exam has now been concluded and Kafka and Echikawa got to do an absolute total of nothing even with their ridiculous formation. Kafka complains that Kaikoru is way too fast, but then his body gives out and he collapses on the ground in exhaustion. While the surveillance drones for the exam are being recalled, the operations team also needs to send some of the injured participants to the hospital to get their wounds treated, but Hoshino seems to have been distracted by how fast Kaikoru managed to deal with the big kaiju all on her own, and he even had to work overtime just to capture that one alive. Mina is impressed by how powerful Kekoru is and Hashino can't deny that she deserves the praise since he had predicted that at least 30 people would drop out this year, but in the end, no one did and that's largely because Kekoru almost solo handled the entire exam. She's bound to become a big shot within the defense force in no time with the amount of skill she possesses, but while she was still out on the battlefield and getting ready to head back so that she can rub her victory in Kafka's face one last time, something appears in the smoke behind her and at the time she notices it, she has been impaled through the chest. On the other side of the field, Kafka is still trying to catch his breath, and he has to admit that Kakoru certainly beat him by a landslide, but he also has her to thank because she helped them last throughout the test by ending it so quickly. But then something horrifying starts happening as dozens of dead kaiju all suddenly start coming back to life. Ichiko thinks they should get out of here quickly since this doesn't look like it's part of the exam, but then Kafka sees something that he can't ignore. Kekoru is on the verge of death, and although she managed to stop her heart from being pierced by focusing her shield on a single point, she is still badly wounded. However, she's not going to let that stop her because there is still a kaiju that needs to be defeated. She looks at the humanoid kaiju, and she wonders what it is and why it's here, but then the kaiju looks back at her and wonders why she isn't dead yet. Kekoru is stunned to find out that the Slenderman kaiju can talk, but then it says it will let the giant kaiju handle her as it revives the monster. Kakoru is still trying to make sense of the fact that this keiju seems to be intelligent, but regardless, she knows she has to do her best to take it down now. However, as she stands to her feet and takes aim, the keiju fires shots at her that render all her limbs useless. The control room has just picked up on Kakoru's injuries, so Koshino asks for a status report on the situation down there. Unfortunately, they don't have visuals anymore since they recalled the drones, but strangely, he is told that the systems are picking up life signals from the kaiju that were already defeated. This makes no sense to Hoshino since Kaiju don't just spontaneously come back to life on their own. And what's even worse, is that they seem to be even more powerful now. With a resilience score of 6.4, the only ones right now that would be able to handle the situation are either him or Mina, so they head out immediately to save the trainees. Meanwhile, on the testing grounds, an order is issued for everyone to evacuate as soon as possible. But Kekoru can't follow that order because if someone doesn't take on the revived big Kaiju, then it will go on a rampage and kill a lot of people. She uses her suit to stop the bleeding of her injuries and stands up once again to fight this thing because as her father always told her, she needs to be the perfect soldier at all times. But then she's immediately squatted away like a fly and slams into a building. As she lies among the rubble, she has her life flash before her eyes and she is sent into a memory of her youth when she got the top score on her exam. The other students all receive praise from their parents, but her father couldn't even be bothered to show up. Her butler informs her that her father will be home today which is a rare occurrence, so she decides to show him her amazing performance. He doesn't care about her successes because success is the bare minimum he expects from her, and rejoicing over it will do nothing but make her weak in the long run. So he tells her to always be perfect, no matter what, for the sake of the nation and for the sake of her dead mother. The overwhelming expectation of her father drives her to never give up, so she jumps back out and keeps firing her gun, all while hearing her father's berating voice in her head. She gets swatted down again, but it doesn't matter because as long as she has still got functional arms, she can keep fighting. Unfortunately, I don't think that arm looks very functional anymore. 
As Kikoru screams out in pain, the Keiju regenerates the horns on its head which are apparently used as an attack weapon. And both Mina and Hoshino are still too far away to assist Kikoru in any way, so it might be over for her. As the Kaiju's energy blast is being charged up, Kaoru accepts her fate and begins apologizing for not being strong enough to protect everyone. But at the last second, Hafka appears in front of her and says she did an amazing job holding out until now. She doesn't understand why Kafka is still here and putting himself in danger. As the blast hits, Kafka tanks it before transforming into his Kaiju form, telling her that he'll handle everything from here on out. Elsewhere, the evacuation efforts are still going on, while the ones skilled enough to do so hold the Kaiju off. They are using flares to direct the candidates on where to evacuate to, but Ichikawa is more concerned about what Kafka doing. Earlier, right after he suggested that they evacuate the area, another soldier came up to the group and tells them all that the giant Keiju has come back to life, but Kaikoru is holding off on her own so no one should head over there. Kafka heard this so he immediately decided to head over there against Ichikawa's wishes. But Ichikawa still hoped Kafka wouldn't end up transforming into a Kaiju in the middle of a Keiju extermination base. But who is he kidding? Kafka is a 100% going to transform because how exactly is he meant to help Kikoru without doing that? Kikoru doesn't understand what's going on because she just saw Kafka turn into a Kaiju, so Kafka turns around and immediately starts begging her not to rat him out to the defense force. While he was doing this, the giant Kaiju has been charging up another blast. But as it fires at the two of them, Kafka quickly turns around and swats it away. He promises to explain things to Kikoru later, but for now, she should just get some rest while he finishes this kaiju off. The control room picks up on Kafka's kaiju energy, and the readings lead to the conclusion that another kaiju has shown up. However, the energy blast seems to have shorted out the cameras, so they got no visuals. But from the readings they are getting, this new kaiju's fortitude is at 9.8. They've never seen a score that high before, but they just chalk it up to the sensors malfunctioning from the blast as well. Back over to Kafka, he knows reinforcements are on their way, so he doesn't have much time to spare here, which is why he will end this all in one punch. The kaiju clashes fists with Kafka, but with Kafka being the more powerful one, the force he generates is enough to literally start ripping the flesh off the bone of the kaiju, leaving nothing but a pair of legs. Kakoru is still trying to process everything she had just witnessed, but then Kafka turns back to her and immediately runs over before bitch slapping a kaiju that was trying to sneak up on her. Now that it is dead, Kafka tells her that she's going to be alright, and he is glad that she is safe. Hearing those words from Kafka's mouth is a breath of fresh air to her with all her daddy issues, but Kafka then scolds her for putting herself in so much danger like she did. But then Ichikawa shows up and scolds Kafka for doing the exact same thing. Kafka is surprised Ichikawa is still here, but he was worried that Kafka may do something stupid while he wasn't there and sure enough he finds Kafka fully transformed out in the open. While he and Ichikawa continue talking, Kakor's injuries finally catch up to her, so she loses consciousness and collapses on the ground. A while later, Hoshino and Mina arrive on the scene, and they are confused as much as they are intrigued by what could have taken out the kaiju and caused this much of a mess. The search team comes back and says they were unable to find any of the mission candidates, but just then, the control room informs them over the comms that Kafka, Ichikawa, and Kekoro have all been spotted making their way into Gate 6, so all the examinees have been accounted for. Hashino admits that Kaikoru is a strong fighter, but he knows there is no way she could have managed to accomplish something like this. There are a lot of unanswered questions from this exam since they still don't know why the Keiju came back to life in the first place, or what caused the carnage here. But Mina says they should call in the investigation and disposal team, so they can get things wrapped up here. Back to Kafka and Ichikawa. Kafka has been hospitalized for his injuries, but he's going to be fine, so Ichikawa is relieved. Kekoru also seems to be recovering well since the defense force is using the best technology available to treat her wounds. Kafka gets a little angry because he doesn't get the same special treatment she does, but then again, all he has is a few minor fractured, so compared to Kekoru, she probably needed it more. Mina has been listening in on their conversation, so she steps in and thanks them both for saving Kikoru's life by carrying her to safety. Kafka wants to talk to her, but he decides to hold off for now until he officially becomes an officer. On Kikoru's end, she is still recovering in the recovery pod, when Hoshino comes in and thanks her for her hard work in defeating that kaiju. She looks a little conflicted, so Hoshino asks if she wasn't the one who defeated the kaiju. Kakoru remembers what happened with Kafka saving her, and even though he is a kaiju, she can't bring herself to sell him out since he was so kind to her, so she lies and says she killed the kaiju after all. Back in town, the report on the incident at the Defense Force has finally made it to the news, and the Slenderman kaiju is currently listening in to hear how much carnage he managed to cause. 
However, when he hears that there were zero casualties over the entire course of the incident, he can't believe it. He is wondering who could have stopped the kaiju he revived, but then he gets a call on his phone, so he reveals that he can transform into a human and answers the call. It is from one of the members of the disposal squad, and the guy is berating him for taking too long on his break, so the kaiju gets up and heads out of the toilet where the entire squad is waiting for him, all none the wiser to the fact that he is a kaiju. A while later, Kafka is freaking out over the exam, and he blames Ichikawa for his anxiety since he is the one who convinced him to sign up again. But Kafka doesn't have any more time to be anxious because the boss comes in and says that both Ichikawa and Kafka have mail. Kafka knows this is his last chance to ever have a hope of standing beside Mina, so he nervously pulls out the paper to see his results. On the day of the entrance ceremony, Izuma walks up to Kagaraji to greet him and congratulate him on passing, but he was already pretty sure that he would pass anyway, so it wasn't a surprise to see him here. To be honest, the people who pass are exactly what he had expected, but he doesn't see Kafka anywhere. Kagaraji asks if Izuma wanted Kafka to pass, but it's not exactly that, he just found him interesting. Just then, Shinomiya shows up and she's basking in the glory of her overwhelming victory during the test, but she has every right to do so because she's actually the best combatant here. Before meeting her, both Izumo and Kagaraji had both thought they would be in first place, but now Izumo thinks they're stuck competing for the number two spot. Kagaraji retorts by saying he scored the highest in the physical fitness test, so they'll keep aiming for number one even if Izumo wants to give up. Elsewhere in the hall, Ichikoa bumps into another one of the successful candidates, and the guy recognizes him from the exam, but he can't recall his name. Ichiko Womo reintroduces himself, and the guy does the same, saying he is called Iharu Furihashi. But he wants to be on a first-name basis with Ichikawa, he decides to call him Reno, and in return, he wants to be called Iharu. Now that they are well acquainted, Iharu asks what happened to Kafka, and if he somehow failed the test, but it seems to be a little more complicated than that. Just then, an announcement that Mina will be entering is made, so everyone goes quiet as she walks in. Once Mina makes it up on stage, the induction ceremony is set to officially commence, so Kaikoru is asked to come up and speak on behalf of the incoming class. As Kikoru walks up on stage, Mina hands her the class roster and welcomes them to the defense force. She also gives special thanks to Kikoru for her help in the incident after the exam because thanks to her, there were no casualties whatsoever. Kikoru feels a little guilty about accepting such high praise from Mina, when she wasn't the one who killed that kaiju. Kafka should be the one hearing these words right now, so why he isn't here. He not only saved her life, but also worried about her like she was a little girl, and she feels a little humiliated about it. But it doesn't look like she needs to worry about that since Kafka sheepishly tiptoes into the room in his new Defense Force uniform a moment later. A lot of people are glad to see him, but some context is needed to know how he managed to not fail. The truth is that he totally failed the exam. He had the lowest score in the fitness exam and he had no aptitude for the suits, so it was a pretty clear failing grade. No one objects to this evaluation, and although Mina wants to stick up for her friend, she also knows she can't give him preferential treatment like this. However, Hoshino is willing to give all the preferential treatment in the world to Kafka, so he says he'll take him under his wing. He justifies it by saying that Kafka's scores may be really low, but in the practical part of the test, he was able to accurately identify the weak points of the Kaju and prioritize helping the overall Keiju extermination effort instead of solely focusing on his own kills. There aren't many people with the skills to do that, but the reason Hoshino wants to bring Kafka aboard is because he thinks he is funny. Hashino wasn't sure if Kafka would ever meet the requirements to become a full officer, but for now, he wants to keep him as a cadet in part of his platoon. Mina explains to everyone that Kafka isn't a full officer yet, so she has him sit out of the induction ceremony, but that still means he passed. Now that that's been settled, Hashino walks up and asks Mina to say a few words to the new officers. She steps up to the mic and addresses everyone, saying that she is glad that they all volunteered to join the Defense Corps and put in the effort necessary to pass that difficult exam. For the last few years, they see more kaiju with far greater fortitude than they've ever seen before, and they also have to worry about strange incidents where kaiju may be able to come back to life. Missions are going to be more dangerous than they've ever been, and some people may die, and there's no guarantee that anyone will make it back from missions alive, so she wants them all to entrust their lives to her. Through all these dangerous missions, she swears that she will be there, standing at the very front and acting as both the shield and spear of the team. And Kafka is so touched by the speech that he blurts out that he will make sure he can stand by Mina's side as well. Everyone is shocked that Kafka would dare speak to the captain so carelessly, but Mina is actually happy that Kafka hasn't forgotten his promise to her. Although she's still the captain, so she decides to punish Kafka for speaking out of turn and tells him to do 100 push-ups. 
Hoshino found the whole thing really funny, so he's not regretting his decision to accept Kafka at all. But being funny isn't the only reason that Hoshino wanted to recruit Kafka. Back when the kaiju started coming back to life, they suddenly saw signals of a 9.8 fortitude kaiju appearing. And while he is still fairly sure that the reading was a malfunction, but at the same time, they also lost signal to the vitals of one examinee. He knows something is off about Kafka simply by the fact that he had zero compatibility with the suit, so he's going to keep a close eye on him to find out what secret he's hiding. Kafka had just finished his 100 push-up punishment and while he's lying on the floor out of exhaustion, Kekora comes up to him and says she wants to talk, so he should come with her. Kafka asks why she can't just talk to him here, but Kekoru doesn't want other people hearing about it, so they start teasing her about wanting to confess to Kafka. Kafka actually believes that's what's going on, but Kekoru denies it and kicks him across the face while Ichikoa watches on with a look of disapproval. Later, the three are sitting in an empty diner and Kafka has just told Kekoru what happened to him back in the hospital, but she finds it hard to believe that he turned into a kaju because he ate one. Kafka thinks it wouldn't be such a big deal to tell the defense force about it since they might be able to cure him, but Kakoru doesn't think there's any chance of that happening. For one, if they don't decide to kill him on the spot, they would probably subject him to countless gruesome experiments, and he is guaranteed to never become an officer at that point. And on top of that, when a kaiju is really powerful, the defense force uses its body to create special weapons after they defeat it, so it's possible they might try to do that to him. After hearing what fate may await him if his secret gets out, Kafka pleads with Kikoru to keep his secret for him. She ends up agreeing to not rat him out since he saved her life, but she says that if she ever finds out that Kafka is a kaiju that will hurt mankind, then she will kill him without mercy. Ichikawa freezes up a little after hearing how serious she is, but Kafka is actually glad because he would never want to be left alive if he was a danger to society. Later on, Ichikawa is taking part in a training exercise where he learns how to use the anti-kaiju guns properly, and he is doing a decent job at it, getting a completion time of just over two and a half minutes, and a suit activation percentage of 18, so he has really improved a lot since he first joined. Because of this, Eharu feels pressure to do just as well as him because he can't let himself get overshadowed. Through the sheer force of petty competition, Eharu is able to get quicker time than Ichikawa, as well as an activation force of 20%, and he wastes no time bragging about his performance to Ichikawa. But then he gets a reminder that there's always someone better when Kikoru shatters his record by a full minute. And with a suit power of 55%, so she wastes no time and rubs it in his face that she's superior. Meanwhile, Izumo is left feeling inadequate by Kikoru's signature look of superiority, but Kagaraji reminds him that if he's got time to be worried, then he's got time to train, otherwise, people are going to catch up to him in no time. Right now, both Izumo and Kagaraji are on equal footing in terms of battle power, and Kafka's just doing his own things because he's excited that he finally got his suit up to 1%. He then turns to Kikoru and proudly declares that he has finally turned his 0 into 1, but she doesn't understand why he's bragging to her when she's at 55. Hoshino still finds him amusing, but he tells Kafka that he's never going to become an officer at this rate, and at most he will last 3 months before he is fired. And after hitting Kafka with facts, he tells everyone that they should run 10 laps around the perimeter, and then training will be done for the day. They don't think it's fair to have to run laps, but because they complain, Hoshino makes it 15 laps instead and tells them to get going. A lot of the new recruits have developed rivalries among each other, and Hoshino is happy to see it because the competition is helping them grow stronger than ever. After training is complete, everyone heads to the baths and Kafka is exhausted from having to run laps at the end of training. But Ichikawa and Eharu seem to be full of energy since Eharu is showing off his muscle gains. But Ichikawa doesn't think it's all that impressive since he has the same amount of muscle mass. Kafka has to get in on this and show the young lads what a real man's muscles look like and Eharu was really impressed. But that didn't last long as Kafka runs out of breath and shows Eharu what a real man's stomach looks like. Eharu and Ichikawa both start laughing at Kafka, but he says the same things will happen to them once they turn 28 so they had better be prepared. But then, everyone gets put in their place when Kagaraji shows up and shows them what the peak physical form looks like. They all jump in the bath out of embarrassment, but the mood soon turns back to regular conversation and Kafka is happy because he hadn't gotten to do stuff like this in a long while. On the girls' side, Kekoru and two relatively unimportant officers walk into the changing room, and they find Mina there, so they were going to leave and let her finish, but Mina says it's alright since she was about to leave anyway. Since they have her permission, they all go their separate ways and Kekoru walks behind Mina to put her clothes in the washing machine. While she does this, she notices that Mina has some decent muscle on her body, but that doesn't explain the ridiculous amount of combat power she is able to produce, 
But all this staring got Mina's attention. So Kakoru asks her directly about how she got her muscles. Mina agrees to show her the basics of her training routine since she's here anyway. And though Kekoru wasn't expecting it, she is still grateful for the kind gesture. Back to the boys, they start talking to each other about why they joined the defense force and Aiharu goes first by explaining that his reasoning for joining is because of Mina. He was saved from a kaiju by her when he was still in middle school and ever since then, he has always wanted to be like her. The others have similar reasons for joining and they all involve admiration for Mina. But when it's Kafka's turn to answer, he freezes up a little but eventually tells them that he is childhood friends with Mina. All the boys are jealous of him, so Kafka tries to step out before things get too heated, but it's already too late for that as they now want to hear everything about Mina's childhood. They end up staying in the bath for so long that by the time Kekor comes out, they've all fainted from heat stroke and Echikawa is stuck trying to revive them. The next day, training continues as usual, and the recruits and everyone begins bonding over the time spent together, but Kafka still sucks compared to everyone else. But the end of the day, everyone is exhausted from all the hard work, but while they are asleep, Kafka is still up working to improve himself, so that he doesn't get kicked off the defense force. After a while, Hashino walks in and finds Kafka working, but while it is an admirable thing to do, sleeping is also an important part of training, so he can't just neglect it. Kafka really doesn't want to get fired, and Hashino assumes it's because of the promise he made with Mina, but Kafka never told him about that, so he's wondering how he could possibly know. Hashino admits that he was listening in on the conversations the guys were having in the bath, but aside from how weird that is, Kafka admits that his motivation is indeed because of the promise he made, so he needs to do whatever it takes to stand at Mina's side. Hashino interprets this to mean that Kafka wants to steal his position as vice captain, and this is exactly what Kafka intends to do, so he will work hard to achieve it. Before Hoshino leaves, he lets Kafka know that he won't be giving up his spot as vice captain so easily. And one more word of advice, he tells Kafka not to get too close to anyone on the team, because in this line of work, anyone could die at any moment, especially if they're getting a lot of screen time. Just then, an alarm bell goes off, which means a keiju emergency is happening right now. So Hoshino tells Kafka to hurry up because it's time for his first mission. After Mina is suited up, she arrives at the meeting room and asks Okonoji to brief her on the situation at hand right now. She is then informed that the area surrounding the incident has been evacuated successfully, with the help of the regular defense force. And the people seem much more relaxed than they should be about a life-threatening emergency since this kind of thing happens all the time. They are receiving status reports from the defense force as they speak and as for the kaju, after it appeared it seems to have grown larger and entered the breeding phase, which means if they don't hurry, then it is going to spew out a ton of smaller kaju. However, there are already tons of keiju surrounding it, so it's going to be a ton of work to clear this thing out. But fortunately, the location is not that far away from here, so if they want to minimize damage, then Mina believes that their best option is to take out the baby-making kaiju before it can have a chance to create more of them. And while she is doing that, she wants the rest of the team to set up sniper spots along the highway to take out as many of the smaller ones as possible. With the game plan covered, she dismisses everyone and they all head into battle. While in the back of his truck, Hoshino asks the team if they are feeling up to the task, because this is a real keiju extermination mission after all, and they all have their own thoughts on the situation. Kakoru for one can't stop thinking about how the old man seated across from her is actually a powerful kaiju, and since she's covering for him, she hopes he doesn't disappoint her. But that is a little too much to ask as Kafka is already sick to his stomach and barfs all over everyone in the back of the truck. After a very gross car ride, they all make it to their station and Kafka finally gets to see the kaiju that they need to take down for this mission. Hashino gives them a rundown of what the plan is, explaining that Mina will be handling the giant kaiju in the middle of the area, but there's another problem since the kaiju is spewing out little kaiju as they speak. So the newbie team is going to be tasked with taking out the hundreds of newly spawned kaiju and making sure that none of them manage to escape this area at all. They need to do a good job here because it will be a huge factor in how much money needs to be spent rebuilding from the damage caused and how long it will take to get things back to normal. Since they are the ones with the least experience, they will be placed at the rear, which also means that if they mess up, then the whole mission is screwed. Hashino then asks if anyone has any questions to ask him, but they all seem to understand things perfectly, so he orders them to show him what they can do on the battlefield. The regular defense force reports to Okonoji that they have officially evacuated all civilians from the Keiju site and all surrounding areas, so she relays the information to the platoons, as well as an ETA of 8 minutes before Kanmina get to her sniping position. With that, it's time for them to move out and Kafka is determined to prove to Hoshino that he has what it takes to become an official member of the Keiju defense force. He knows he won't get another chance to show what he can do after this, so he is insanely nervous, but he also feels oddly excited for some reason. 
Just then, they get a report of a small kaiju being spotted nearby. So the team moves out and jumps off the roof to engage, but Kafka doesn't have the same strength they have. So he has to do the reverse Spider-Man climb. Meanwhile, Mina has made it to her designated sniping location. So Okanuji instructs the regular defense force to help lure the giant kaiju towards her. The defense force does as instructed and fires off several missiles at the kaiju in an attempt to get its attention, and it works as the monster begins heading towards the intended location. Meanwhile, on the ground, Kafka and the others prepare to hold their ground against the kaiju that will be heading their way and Kafka notes that he feels oddly calm about the whole thing, and he attributes it to the feeling that the suit is giving him strength, so he is confident in his ability to handle this. However, his suit power is still only at 1%, so he is bodied by the first kaiju that hits him and lands in a bag of trash. Kakora scolds him for going too far out in front when he is the weakest out of all of them, telling Kafka that he should have stayed back and helped from the rear. One of the older Defense Force members is annoying that he has to babysit the newbies and deal with their screw-ups, since he would prefer it if they just sat and watched the professionals work from a distance. But Kakoru takes offense to their sense of superiority, so she goes into combat and completely obliterates the first wave of kaiju which the so-called professionals were having so much trouble with. The man is forced to admit that Kakoru outclasses him in every way and Kafka gives her two thumbs up for a job well done, which makes her blush since she still isn't used to receiving praise like that. Meanwhile, the other unit is facing their own kaiju, and they manage to take out the legs of two, which then allows Yuharu to swoop down and finish them off. He promptly turns to Ichikawa to show off his impressive kill, but as he does so, he sees Ichikawa take down a bigger kaiju all by himself, and he is shocked. He asks if Ichikawa really did that alone, so he explains that he swapped out the usual ammo in his gun for some freeze rounds. This way he can slow down kaiju while he fights, and in the long run, he'll be able to become even better at hunting kaiju. He still isn't satisfied with his current strength because he wants to become powerful enough so that Kafko will never need to transform to handle a threat again. At the same time, Kagaraji and Izumo are both holding off swarms of kaiju all by themselves. So the veteran Defense Force members are wondering what's up with this year's new recruits since they are way stronger than anything they've seen before, and it's making the older members lose confidence in themselves. Platoon leader Nakanashima knew that the new batch of soldiers was good, but she never would have imagined that they would be so skilled and good-looking too. That aside, even though there are a few exceptional recruits, the average power among them is still a lot higher than it has been in previous years, and the more powerful team members are serving as motivation for the others to grow stronger as well. Okanagi scans the area and relays that all the keiju in the area have been defeated, so she advises the Ikaruga platoon to advance with Ichikawa and Eiharu taking the front line. Kafka has listening to how well everyone is performing, yet he hasn't done a single thing throughout this whole process, so he is stuck wondering if there is any way he can contribute. He then remembers something that was said earlier about no one being sure when the vulnerabilities are on the kaiju, and that's something he can help with. He heads over to a kaiju corpse, and even with just 1% power, it is already a whole lot easier to dismantle the body, so he wishes the defense force could have supplied these suits back when he still worked in cleaning. He cuts into the kaiju's organs, and it looks pretty standard for a fumble-type kaiju, but the core isn't where it usually is, so he has to do a little extra digging around until he ends up finding something really important. He immediately calls Hoshino, and informs him that he has located the core of these kaiju, and it's located around the base of the neck, but he has something else to report as well. The smaller kaiju also have baby sacks, so if they don't destroy them, then the corpses will eventually produce even more kaiju. Hashino is impressed with Kafka's work and tells Okonoji to relay the information to the rest of the team. Kafka is glad he was actually able to be helpful to the defense force, but this is no time to be relaxing, so he decides to help out more and start neutralizing all the reproductive organs of the defeated kaiju. As Kafka was on his way to destroy more kaiju eggs, he notices a blinding light behind him, and it seems like Mina's platoon is finally ready to engage with the giant kaiju, so they ask for the air force to clear the area to avoid friendly fire. Immediately after, the defense force opens fire on the kaiju's legs to keep it from moving away, and while it's stuck in place, Mina lines up the perfect shot. Since there are no obstructions, Okanoji gives the all-clear for Mina to fire, and as she does, a green blast is sent hurtling towards the kaiju and tears straight through its body. Kafka is astonished by the level of power Mina is able to exert, but the kaiju's core is still intact, so Mina opts to chamber and fire another round to take it out for good. The second shot is fired, and the kaiju's head is blown clean off, so it collapses to the ground. But Mina isn't satisfied with just a double tap, so she chambers another round and gets ready to fire the kaiju again, and this time it has to be dead for sure. But yet again, Mina is not satisfied and chambers another round, which Okanaji doesn't approve of since the kaiju is clearly dead, 
and those bullets cost 10% of the annual budget. But Mina insists on firing again, so Akanaji gives the all clear, and the shot is fired. On the ground, Hashino approaches Kafka and asks if he is ready to consider giving up on trying to stand beside Mina, because doing so would mean that he needs to display an equal amount of strength. Kafka asks if Hoshino is capable of doing something like that, but there's no way he could ever pull something like that off. His combat power isn't as good when it comes to long-range attacks, so Mina is a lot better at taking out huge kaiju than he is. But when it comes to mid-sized ones, Hashino is a bit better at handling them. A kaiju sneaks up on him while he was still talking, but this just gave him the perfect opportunity to display his skills as it looks like he simply touches his swords. But in an instant, he was able to dice up the kaiju without even needing to turn around. He explains that his family is a clan of kaiju hunters that have been at it for centuries, so Hoshino has been trained in the use of a katana to fight. The captain and vice captain are the strongest member of the division, so they get weapons that are tailored to their preferred fighting style. Mina fires yet another shot at the kaiju, and this time she is satisfied with her work, so Hoshino tells Kafka that they need to back away because the real show is about to begin. Kafka doesn't understand what he means since the kaiju has clearly been taken down already, but the real issue wasn't the kaiju, but rather the thousands of spores that it was housing. And now that it has been killed, all those smaller kaiju are going to come pouring out in droves. Hashino tells everyone that once they've dealt with all the little guys, they can all head home and have a nice breakfast. Izumo complains that the job is easier said than done, and the veterans take that as a sign of weakness. So they begin mocking Kagaraji and Izumo and all work together to regain some of their dignity in the face of the new recruits. After the others have left, Akanoshima comes up to Izumo and Kagaraji and tells them that it's alright to be tired after their first mission, so if they want, they are free to take a break and let the veterans handle the rest. But neither of them are on board with that idea, so they both rush off to help with the last part of the extermination as well. Akanoji is a bit concerned about the vitals of the new recruits since they are all exhausted and are barely holding out, but Hoshino already expected as much since this is a pretty big mission, but if they can manage to get through this challenge, then it'll take them to the next level. Most officers can only achieve a combat power of 20 or 30, but those who manage to break through and go higher are the ones who end up as captains. Right now, the only one on the team who is capable of this is Kikoru, but Hoshino has his eyes on Ichikawa, because he believes he will be able to achieve the same level of growth. Iharu is growing frustrated by how much Ichikawa is outpacing him despite all the time he spent in school, specifically for this job, but his feelings will have to wait because they've taken out all the kaiju in this area and need to return to the rest of the group. As they are running though, they come across a person standing over a kaiju corpse. This person is talking about how he went through all the trouble of planting reproductive organs in the kaiju, yet the defense force still managed to stop it, and that's when they realize that this is not an ordinary person. The guy gets up and points his finger at Iharu, and it doesn't look good, so Ichikawa yells for Iharu to get out of the way, but he was too slow, so he ended up getting shot through the chest. Fortunately, he managed to avoid losing his heart to the attack, but the bleeding is still really bad for his health, so Ichikawa tries to calm him down so he can use his suit to stop the bleeding. By now, they realize that this thing must be a kaiju as well, but there is only one humanoid kaiju other than Kafka, and that is kaiju number 9. They both recognize it as the one that attacked during the exam, and this thing was able to defeat Kikoro really easily, so they need to be careful. Number 9 is talking about how disappointed he is with his failed implants, but he doesn't want to leave here empty-handed either, so he decides to at least take a live sample of a Defense Force officer. Ichikawa and Eiharu are both spooked after hearing that, but they still need to keep their composure, so Ichikawa tries to call the platoon leader to inform her of the situation, so they can get back up. However, the transmission fails because Number 9 had enough time as a human to figure out how radio signals work, so he created his zone around this place where no signals can be sent or received. This way, he can stay hidden from the defense force, since they won't be able to pick up his energy signature, and it has the added bonus of preventing any outgoing distress calls. He points his finger at Ichikawa, this time to attack him, and even though he knew what was coming, Ichikawa was still unable to completely dodge the finger bullets, so he gets incapacitated. Number 9 is a little confused since even though he did hit Ichikawa, he missed all the vital organs he was targeting, which leads him to realize that Ichikawa must be able to see the attacks coming somehow. Back when Kafka and Ichikawa met with Kikoru in the diner, she wanted to tell them about the encounter she had with Number 9 in case they ever happened to run into it. The finger bullets he was using may look like magic at first, but if you pay close attention to his fingers, you'll be able to figure out when he's going to fire. And once Ichikawa gets the hang of it, he is finally able to dodge the bullets completely. Iharu is shocked that Ichikawa was actually able to dodge such a quick attack, 
And with the time he was able to buy, Ichikawa returns fire at number 9 so that Iharu can get away. Iharu doesn't like the idea of letting himself be protected by Ichikawa. But as things stand now, he's not going to be of much use in this fight as he nearly gets smacked again. After saving him, Ichikawa pleads once more for him to just go. And this time, Iharu understands how bad the situation really is, so he listens and starts hobbling away. Ichikawa may be brave for standing against number 9 by himself, but he knows Kikoru didn't stand a chance against this thing, so there's no way in hell he'll be able to win either. Yet, even with the odds stacked against him, Ichikawa wants to become an officer who is able to risk his life to save his friends like Kafka did for him, so he charges forward in an attempt to buy enough time for Iharu to make it out of here alive. While he is doing that, Iharu is retreating and coming to terms with the fact that Ichikawa is so much stronger than he is right now. He doesn't want to admit it, but he hit a wall in his training recently. Hashino told everyone that most officers plateau in strength once they achieve around 20 or 30% combatability. However, he also mentioned that everyone has the potential to overcome this barrier as long as they put in the required effort. Iharu had been stuck at 20% for the past two weeks already, yet despite his motivation to keep growing stronger, he was still surpassed so easily by Ichikawa and he hates himself for it. Ichikawa is still doing his best to keep number 9 at bay, but 9 dodges all the shots and appears inches away from Ichikawa, just to taunt him. Ichikawa may have some information about 9, but there's still a lot about him that he doesn't know, and 9 is going to take full advantage of that. As the new finger bullets are fired, a dust cloud is kicked up, it would seem that Ichikawa has met his end, but fortunately, Ihara returned just in time to save him. He is done feeling sorry for himself and getting saved, so he makes up his mind that he is going to save Ichikawa this time. Although he has still got a hole in his chest, so we can't overdo it. Ichikawa doesn't understand why Iharu would come back here and put himself in harm's way, but if he hadn't done so, then Ichikawa would have been dead by now. Besides, number 9 mentions that his barrier prevents anything from leaving without his permission. So there's no way Iharu would have been able to get out of here in the first place. The only option they've got left is to stand together and try to take down number 9, although Iharu isn't going to be able to help out much with his current injury, so he says he'll do his best to create an opening for Ichikawa, and when he does, Ichikawa better hit 9 as hard as he can. They are both in agreement, so Ichikawa charges forward while Iharu gets down and provides cover fire for him. The bullets he fires are a special conductor variant, so they work well to restrain 9, but since 9 recognizes Iharu as an annoying problem to deal with, he targets him first. Iharu isn't able to get up to dodge, but with a little extra focus, he's able to tell when the attack is coming, so he has learned to dodge as well. While 9 is still confused about why his shot missed, Iharu managed to strike him in the leg with the conductor bullets, and that provides the perfect opening for Ichikawa to get into position and unleash his suit's maximum output. He then proceeds to unload his entire magazine into 9, but once the dust settles, he is horrified to discover that not a single one of the bullets actually managed to connect. 9 had built a wall of corpses to protect himself, and now that Ichikawa is out of bullets, there is nothing he can do to stop 9 from turning him into Swiss cheese with his finger bullets. Meanwhile, outside the barrier, Hashino has just been informed that communications with Iharu and Ichikawa have been lost, as well as all signals for their vital signs, so there may be cause to worry. Kafka heard the report and coupled with the strange behavior of the Keiju here, he and Kaikoro realized that Keiju number 9 must be here somewhere. After all the bullets Ichikawa got hit with, his entire body is burning with pain, but he is still trying his hardest to stay conscious and keep fighting. Number 9 is surprised that Ichikawa is still able to move after all the damage he has taken, but since he wants a living test subject, he doesn't want to kill him outright. He is about to try other ways to incapacitate Ichikawa. But Haru refuses to let Nine do any more harm to his friend and fires several bullets at him. However, Nine, now that he has seen the gun once, Nine can just deflect all the bullets easily, and after he takes out Aharu, he walks back over to Ichikawa to find out how much damage it takes to stop him from moving. Aharu hates seeing his friend get hurt in front of him, and he doesn't like to admit it, but Ichikawa is more talented than him, so as he reaches for his gun, he refuses to let him die here. However, he is out of ammo, so there really is nothing he can do to save Ichikawa. Iharu loses hope and accepts that he's going to die here, but he just wants Ichikawa to be saved somehow. Nine directs his attention to Iharu, and since he already managed to get Ichikawa to stop moving, he doesn't need Iharu alive anymore and points his finger to finish him off. But at the last second, Kafka appears behind him and cleanly punches Nine's head off his body. Kafka then kneels down beside Ichikawa and apologizes to him for being late, but Ishikawa just blames himself for being so weak in the first place. He really wanted to handle this on his own so that Kafka wouldn't be forced to transform, but things didn't turn out the way he wanted. 
Yahara has already begun the panic since from his perspective, a second powerful Kaiju just showed up, but he still can't do anything about it. It turns out number 9 is able to stay alive even after being decapitated, so as it picks its head back up, Kafka sets Ichikawa down because he knows things are about to get violent. Ichikawa doesn't want Kafka to get himself into any trouble, but Kafka says it is fine and Ichikawa should just focus on getting his wounds sealed with the suit so he doesn't bleed out. And while he's doing that, Kafka is going to deal with Nine. Once Nine has his head back on his shoulders, he isn't angry, but he asks why Kafka attacked him out of nowhere when they are both kaiju. Regardless, he realizes that Kafka is really strong, so he wants to take his corpse for himself, which is why he fires a shot at him. It doesn't do nearly as much damage as it did to Ichikawa. So Nine decides to step things up a notch if he wants to take down a keiju of such a caliber. Nine whips out several body bullets of massive scale, so he can fire them at Kafka, but Kafka is more enraged by the fact that Nine has been shooting Ichikawa and Aharu's squishy human bodies with these bullets all this time. He can imagine the pain and suffering they must have gone through up till now, so he is going to make Nine pay for what he has done. Nine starts firing his bullets at Kafka, but he just stands there, and just before he gets hit, he unleashes a shockwave that blocks them all. Immediately after, he flash steps in front of Nine and delivers a barrage of punches to his body, while also rearranging Nine's dental structure. Nine tries to defend himself, but nothing he is trying is doing any good against Kafka's relentless attacks, so he decides that the best course of action is to retreat. However, Kafka isn't letting him get away as he readies himself for his finishing punch. Nine realizes that he is screwed at this point, and after he gets punched across four city blocks, he is left disfigured, dismembered, and with his core completely exposed. Kafka catches up to him, and is about to smash his core to finish him off for good. But just then, a couple of Defense Force soldiers spot him and report that they've encountered a humanoid kaiju. Meanwhile, Kakoru is struggling to take down one of the remaining kenijū from earlier since her gun isn't powerful enough to damage it. So she takes matters into her own hands and grabs a nearby sign to use as a weapon. And with it, she splits the kaiju in half. Now that she is done with that, she wonders where Kafka could have gone. Earlier, after they found out Aharu and Ichikola went missing, Kafka decided to go look for them. But Kekoro questioned how he was meant to do that when they had no way of communicating with them. Kafka explained that as long as they are being attacked by the humanoid kaiju, then he should be able to sense their location. He then transformed and jumped away. But even if his intention was to save Ichikawa, transforming in the middle of an active defense force battle zone is insanely risky. The report of humanoid kaiju reaches Hoshino, so he starts moving to provide assistance. And back with Kafka, he got distracted by the officers, so Number 9 was able to regenerate his body and escape imminent death. He says he has figured out how Kafka's body works, so next time, he should be able to kill him. Kafka refuses to let there be a next time, so he prepares to chase after Nine, but Nine opens fire on the Defense Force officers, so Kafka is forced to go back and defend them. Nine then uses the opportunity to disintegrate himself to get away, which is something I guess he can just do, and since Nine has gotten away, Kafka thinks now would be a good time for him to leave as well. He punches the ground to create a distraction, and then jumps into the air to escape. And while he is disappointed that he didn't manage to kill Nine, he at least saved Ichikawa and Eharu from dying, so he's happy with what he achieved. Just when he thinks he is in the clear, Vice Captain Hoshina appears behind him. He believes Kafka is the one who injured Ichikawa and Eharu, so he is pretty pissed at this point and plans to take it out on Kafka. In a blink of an eye, Hoshina is right in front of him and nearly slices Kafka's head off, so Kafka is forced to retreat from him as he tries to land more strikes. Kafka recalls Hoshina telling him that he is particularly skilled when it comes to taking down smaller kaiju and it looks like he wasn't joking. Kafka has only ever seen Hoshina when he was smiling, but he's a completely different person when he is serious. As Hoshina exits the alley, he requests permission to remove the limiter on his suit and unleashes his full combat power of 92, completely intent on killing off kaiju number 8. Kafka doesn't want to hurt Hoshina, so he is hesitant to fight him since his fists are lethal weapons, but while he is still thinking, he gets slashed up in an instant by Hoshina, so he knows that he won't survive unless he takes this fight seriously. Hoshina jumps in for another attack, but Kafka is able to dodge it this time by leaping backward, however, that doesn't mean he has escaped Hoshina's wrath. As he is getting chased down, he is unable to harden his body quick enough to counter all of Hoshina's strikes. He may not be stronger than Kafka, but he is way faster than him. He thought Kakoru was amazing when she moved on the battlefield, but right now, Hoshina doesn't even look like he's human with how he's darting around. He performs another slash, and though Kafka was able to prevent it from being fatal, it still cuts deep into his body and exposes his core. He is trying to figure out what kind of move Hoshina used to slash him since he couldn't see it coming. 
so he finds a place to stand his ground and regenerate his damaged body. This is the first time he has had to regenerate his body, and he can already tell that doing this eats up a lot of his stamina, so he can't afford to get slashed like that again. Hashina is still in hot pursuit, and he's been surprised throughout the whole fight. He's attacking with his full power, yet the kaiju is still holding him off. That must mean it is at least a fortitude 8, but that's not the only strange thing about it. The way the kaiju fights isn't normal, but it's not like it's going to matter anyway since all he needs to do is make sure it can't counter his next attack. He charges up his blades and once it's at full power, he sends out an energy wave in Kafka's direction. Kafka knows this is going to be bad, so he tries to jump out of the way, but still gets his leg cut off. And the moment of immobility caused by his missing leg was all Hoshina needed to close the distance and appear right under Kafka to finish him off. He strikes at Kafka's core, but he is shocked when he finds out that Kafka had grown a set of teeth to grab his blade and stop it from penetrating the core. He is now unable to pull his blade out, so Kafka takes the opportunity to retaliate and charges out one of his mega punches. But since he still doesn't want to kill Hoshina, he aims for the ground instead and blows him away with the pressure from the punch. And once Hoshina loses sight of him due to the kicked up dust, Kafka vanishes into the night. Hoshina is disappointed in himself for failing to subjugate Kaju number 8 just now. But he still needs to report what happened, so he calls Mina on the radio and informs her of the situation. Meanwhile, Kagoru is having a moment of deep thought about Kafka. He may have saved her back during the exam, but is it really alright for her to believe in him when he's a kaiju? Just then, Kafka shows up after returning to his human form and Kagoru's true feelings about him are as clear as the excitement on her face. Kafka apologizes for acting so recklessly, since she must have been worried about him. He's low on energy after all the regenerating he had to do to recover from his fight with Hashina, so he nearly collapses, forcing Kikoru to hold him up. Kafka apologizes to her for not being able to finish off Keiju number 9, but she says it's alright since she was planning to get her revenge personally and kill it with her own hands. Kafka smiles at her, but then he starts walking away even though he's in horrible condition. He says he wants to go to Ichikawa and Eiharu since they were injured really badly. But Kikoru pulls him back and asks if he has a medical degree that he plans he use to help them. They are already in the care of the defense force, and with the new medical technology they've been developing, Ichikawa and Eiharu should be healed up in no time. Kafka should instead be worrying about himself because not only did he get spotted by some officers, but he also got into a fight with Vice Captain Hoshina. If he's not careful, it's only going to be a matter of time before he gets found out. While everyone is finishing off the last of their targets and getting ready to head home, Hashima is deep in thought over his encounter with Keiju number 8. Mina approaches him since it's rare for him to be so upset, so rare in fact that she's taking a picture to remember it by. She then asks Hoshina if number 8 was really that strong and confirms it, stating that it is one of the strongest out there. If that's true, then number 8 is an anomaly since there hasn't been a Kaiju as strong as him in the past 5 years. It is fortunate that there have been no casualties caused by it yet, and it doesn't seem like the type to just indiscriminately attack people. And that's precisely why Hoshina found their fight strange. It had the opportunity to punch him, yet it chose to strike the ground instead, and throughout the entire fight, it felt more like Hoshina was fighting a human rather than a kaiju. Mena tells Hoshina to take a break since he must be exhausted from his fight. She'll take over for him here, and on the matter of number 8, it doesn't matter what kind of kaiju it is, or how strangely it behaved. As long as it is a kaiju, it's their job to neutralize it. Just then, Hoshina and Mina receive a report from one of the platoon leaders. They just finished speaking with Ichikawa and Aharu, and they were informed that the kaiju that injured them is the same one from the exam. And furthermore, when they first found it, it had a human form. At the same time, kaiju number 9 is back in human form again and walking down the road when a car pulls up behind him. The man in the car is just on his way home from work, so he wants the guy standing in the middle of the street to get out of the way. Nine raises his finger in an attempt to kill this annoying human with his finger bullets, but Yun changes his mind and walks behind him instead. The man from the car is getting freaked out at this point and things don't get better for him as by the time he turns around, he sees Nine transform to make his head huge, and then the man gets eaten whole. A while later, Nine is transformed into the man and is currently driving away while listening to the news. And the next thing on his agenda is to find a way to kill Kafka. Back at the hospital, Ichikawa has just woken up and is greeted by Kafka and Kikoru, who have been sitting at his bedside. They are glad to see Ichikawa is alright and Ichikawa thanks Kafka for saving him back there but from the reaction Kafka and Kekoru give him he probably shouldn't have said that. Ichikawa had failed to realize that Iharu was also in the room, so now he is wondering why Kafka is receiving thanks when it was Kaju number 8 that saved them. 
Kikoru thinks quickly and passes it off as Ichikawa thanking Kafka for identifying the spores on the mushroom kaiju since that was a huge help in the battle, and it makes enough sense, so Yaru accepts it. Although, he is still curious to find out why a kaiju would save humans in the first place. It was able to completely obliterate number 9 in a matter of seconds, so even for a kaiju, Iharu thinks it was pretty cool. Although, he doesn't understand why Kafka is blushing after hearing him say that. Once Ichikawa and Iharu finally get discharged from the hospital, they are shocked when they find out that the whole team organized a surprise party. The party is to celebrate everyone's first successful mission, so they all waited for the two of them to return so they could be a part of it. And since everyone is present now, Kafka calls for the party to start. But he wasn't expecting what happened next. They are presented with the finest A6 Wagyu beef in the world. And it's because the chef would serve no less to someone like Izumo. Izumo complains because he remembers asking the chef not to go overboard, but the chef assured him that he won't be charged extra for this. This whole situation has Kafka wondering who Izumo is, and Kakoro is frankly shocked that Kafka never bothered Googling him. He is literally the Herod Izumo Technologies, the largest anti-kaiju weapons manufacturers in the country and the ones who made the suits all the Defense Force soldiers wear, so he's probably the richest person in Japan right now. Hashina addresses everyone at the party and tells them that it is rare to get days off like this, so they should all make sure to enjoy themselves as much as possible. The party begins, and it's going great, so Ichikawa thanks Hoshina for being kind enough to let them do this, but Hashina didn't set the party up just out of kindness. He has something else that he is waiting to see, and soon enough, the show begins as people start arguing. Kakoru calls Iharu for being too focused on showing off to Ichikawa, but Ikaru doesn't want to hear it from her since she does nothing but show off during battles. And it's not just them either as everywhere Ichikawa looks, people have started arguing about little things that happened over the course of the mission, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. They are all just communicating and trying to figure out what they can improve on so they can do better next time. But that also doesn't mean there aren't going to be regular old arguments too. Meanwhile, out in the hallway, Izumo is talking with the chef, and Dojima expresses how happy he was when Izumo reached out to him. He thought he would never see him again after what happened last time. He asks Izumo about his father, and not much has changed regarding their relationship since Izumo still refuses to speak to his father after a prior incident they had. Just then, Kagaraji happened to show up, but you know he clearly overheard everything. He can tell that it's a private matter, so he just keeps walking to the bathroom. Back inside, Hashina has finally calmed things down and tells everyone that he has an announcement to make. He calls Kafka and tells him that he is being recognized for the help he provided during the last mission. His info on the spores saved a lot of lives, so he has officially been promoted to a full member of the Defense Force. Everyone celebrates Kafka's achievements, and the next day, Kafka is officially inducted by Mina. He is happy, but he also wants to be careful not to speak out of turn like last time, so he awkwardly excuses himself. But as he is leaving, Mina reminds him that he still has a long way to go before he could ever stand by her side, showing that she still remembers the promise she made with Kafka. He excitedly responds that he won't let her down, but that Counts is speaking out of turn, so she gives him 50 push-ups. She still has a meeting to attend regarding the appearance of Keiju number 8 and 9, so Kafka will have to ask Hoshina about the paperwork for his new officer status. She also tells him that Hoshina was the one who recommended him for the promotion, so he had better live up to his expectations. Late into the night, Kafka is up late, studying as usual, but since he has been up for a long time now, he decides to call it a night before he gets scolded by Hoshina for neglecting his sleep. But as he exits the room, he notices that the lights are still on in the training room, so he goes to check it out. And that's when he spots Hoshina in the middle of his training routine. He seems to be doing some mental imagery training, specifically involving the battle he had this morning. He is finding ways he could have improved his attacks, and seeing him so serious scares Kafka a little so he ends up falling over. That's when Hoshina finally notices him and complains that Kafka is staying up too late again. Kafka asks Hoshina why he is training late as well, so Hoshi then explains that he needs to make sure that he is able to finish off Kaiju number 8 the next time they meet. He has thought about the fight a lot, and he realized that he messed up right at the beginning since he could have won if he had gone all out from the start. No normal officer would be able to handle a monster as strong as 8 or 9, so Hoshina needs to make sure that he is strong enough to do it instead. Kafka realizes how hard Hoshina is working to be able to protect everyone, so he promises to try to live up to his expectations. Hoshina puts him in a headlock for saying something so presumptuous when his combat power is still only at 1%. But if he wants to help so bad, Hoshina is fine with Kafka, just living up to 1% of his expectations for now. He's done with his training for the night, so he's going to head back to the main office and tells Kafka to make sure he goes to bed soon. 
But up in the sky, danger is looming as a new humanoid kaiju is preparing an attack with his fleet of aerial kaiju. This was the end of episode 8. Thanks for watching, subscribe to not miss the next part.